This is border country, the dividing line between the British province of Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. The border meanders for nearly 300 miles. It was created in 1922, when Ireland became a free state and Ulster remained British. This is the border, cause of some 2,000 deaths on this island over the last 10 years. It's virtually impossible to seal off this border. Is the border the source of the trouble, or is it merely a symptom? There's a lot of money made off the border. All kinds of smuggling, be it cattle, cigarettes, alcohol. Your job is to protect the border. Hello, is that the IRA Publicity Bureau, please? I grew up hating the people in the uniforms. I grew up hating the police, I grew up hating the British Army. And I ended up joining the IRA. The border has a huge impact on my life. Everything I do now is affected by that one moment in time. The existence of the border has caused dispute and bloodshed. But nevertheless, it constitutes an international frontier. Would its removal unite the hearts and minds of the people of this island? Or do the divisions run too deep? Do you like the border? <laughs> of course I don't like the border. The border should never have existed on this island. I get fed up when people keep talking about the Irish border. It's a British border. Partitioned by a treaty signed in 1922, six counties lie to the north, 26 counties of the Republic to the south. Between the two is the border, manned on either side by customs guards as if the people and the land were different. My name is Paddy Gillespie. I like to be called Paddy because I really am a Paddy. And I'm older than the Irish border. I'm 102, so I know quite a bit about the activities and what went on across the border. It was all about a division in our wee island of Ireland. There was 32 counties and there were six of them taken away. And uh, that was run by the British government and left Ireland with 26 counties, which, so up to date, were doing all right and were managed all right and were living fairly peacefully. <laughs> My family have been resident here in the border area for well over 200 years. They came here as soldiers towards the end of the 17th century during the reigns of Elizabeth and also of Charles I. Ah, just perfect. Just perfect. England was driven by a very serious concern for security. They wanted to prevent either the Spaniards or later the French from using Ireland as a beachhead and potentially launching a direct invasion of England. And therefore, there was a considerable effort on behalf of successive British governments to settle Protestants on the island of Ireland, where the vast mass were Catholic. I think any border that is imposed upon a country from outside is going to create scars both on the land and also in people's minds. There is absolutely no question the imposition of a border has been a disaster for the island of Ireland. England seemed to dominate lots of places across the world and built barriers and invaded different countries. But I'll tell you, I would have preferred to have stayed out of our wee island. When I was 17, 
when you wanted to go over the border, you were issued with a book, which entitled you had to go on and have this book stamped. And if you stayed over on the border, even if you're only in for an hour, you had to have it stamped coming out again. You're trying to get into your, your own country and across your own river. No one likes this frontier, like a scar on a beautiful woman's face. And it made you feel, am I wanted here? Am I part of this country? Am I part of Ireland? Travelers are stopped by Irish guards as they leave the Republic, by Her Majesty's men a few yards farther on as they enter Ulster. To the tourist, it is an inconvenience. To the patriot, an open wound. And to a segment of the Irish youth, a call to violent action. This is a smuggler. She's on a return trip from Britain into Ireland with quantities of butter, bread, and tin food, all of which are cheaper in Ulster. Smuggling is an old tradition around here, and they start them kind of young. Once a year, my mother would take us on the train up from Dublin up to Belfast to buy clothes, because clothes were much cheaper in the north than they were in the south. And I just remember vividly the change in your body as you came back across the border because you have five layers of clothes on, uh, supposedly to fool the customs officials, you know, that you were, you were smuggling these clothes basically by wearing them. So you went up as a skinny little kid and you came back as a kind of Michelin man, you know. I smuggled my wedding dress, and I'm sure you smuggled yours. I smuggled my wedding dress. I smuggled the curtains that, uh, for the dining room wonders. I'll tell you, I used to be sitting maybe seven or eight cars in front of you, coming to the customs, you know, and the custom man coming out and checking all them cars, and you sitting sweating, and by chance, you sort of waved you on, oh my God, oh my, you know. I know, you felt so relieved. Oh, relieved, surely to God. You went and you smuggled the flour, and the bread, and the butter, and the tea, and the uh, cigarettes. Yeah. Was things that was, were smuggled. In John Britton's pub, which quenches thirst for 13 hours a day, cigarettes are up to a shilling cheaper. So addicts flock in from across the border to buy over 200,000 cigarettes a week. I remember smuggling cows, cattle across the river. Many a farmer took to smuggling cattle across the border to markets in Northern Ireland. Four of us were asked to help seven or eight head of cattle across the river. Now, we had a great bit of bother getting them into the river. And we all followed with sticks and battered them across the river. And I had, I wasn't a good swimmer. So as soon as I went into chest deep, I had to hold on to a cow's tail. And unbelievable or not, if somebody had told me that cows could swim, I would have laughed at them. But that cow took me across. No problem at all. It wasn't very heavy. <laughs> you used to get some money from the state, so you'd get a kind of a headage payment for every pig you exported. It was a little inducement um, for exporters. And there's anecdotal uh, evidence that people used to smuggle pigs across the border. So they would export a lorry load of pigs, get the check, and uh, then they would drive those pigs back across the border and a few days later export the same pigs. Customs officials wouldn't recognise them as the pigs that crossed the border two or three days ago. So you would be paid twice for the same lorry load of pigs. I think there's a tendency to look at the border uh, and smuggling for comic relief of something that was actually quite distressful. Smuggling wasn't uh, a hobby. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a comic event. It was economic necessity for a lot of people. Straban has the highest proportion of people out of work in the whole of the United Kingdom. At least one in three men here is unemployed, and unless he has brilliant exam results, a boy who's now in his last year at school has probably less chance of finding a job than anywhere else in Europe. The border definitely affected Staban. There's no question about it. There was no work on Staban. There was no jobs in Staban. There was no industry in Staban. My wife didn't like this idea of smuggling at all. She didn't like it. Although she had to admit the money was useful. <laughs> goes down roads, it goes through houses, it goes through streams, it crosses fields. 
The border is like a child took a pen to the map of Ireland, just did a squiggly line across the top of it. If I get caught speeding on this side, I'll get fined in euros. And if I get caught speeding on this side, I'll get fined in pounds. Unless I'll get run over on the border. So I don't know which ambulance will come to get us. <laughs> Mr. McRae, a shopkeeper, undertaker, and a Protestant, buries the British. When a Catholic dies, he drives Pettigo's one and only hearse to the border, where John Britton, who's Irish in spite of his name, collects the hearse and goes off to bury his fellow Catholics. Where are you for today? Well, they shouldn't. Well, they shouldn't? Yeah. Good. Safe journey. <laughs> There's this idea that the Protestants have a really strong work ethic and that Catholics are inherently lazy. Like if I tidied my house, I would go around, and I do say it, I know I say it, I said, no, that's a bit more Protestant looking because it means it's nice and tidy and clean and organised. What a weird thing to say. Well, a diamond turns to shit and the lines and the number strikes your spell. But the Catholics, I think, are considered to be a bit more crack, a bit more laid back, you know, uh, a bit more kind of drinking and dancing and singing and the traditional music and all of that kind of thing. Protestants would be seen to be quite uptight, a bit um, straight-laced. As a Protestant child, I, I crossed the border to go to my church and... and when I crossed the border, I felt almost like people were staring at me. I was a foreigner in a foreign land. Even on the buses, for example, Protestants sat one side, Catholics sat the other side. You know, you lived a totally different community. You didn't mix in any way. And that, that was a sad state of affairs because my family were all from Southern Ireland originally and we felt like we were um, foreigners in our own land. As a kid crossing the border, you did feel that you were into a different kind of terrain. We had a very ignorant view of the North. We thought of the North as Protestant exclusively. You know? We were actually very unaware, oddly enough, of, of people like us, you know, the Irish Catholics being north of the border. the importance of being a Catholic in the North. The first time I met a Protestant, I was working part-time in Dunn stores, and this girl came in on work experience. And we were told, this girl's a Protestant. But what I believed at that time about Protestant people was one, they all hated us. I had asked my father why they all hated us so much, and he told me was that they believed that our Pope was the Antichrist, so they thought we were all Antichrists. And I remember thinking, God, if I thought somebody was not crazy, I wouldn't like them either. So this young girl is coming in and work experience and I'm expecting somebody who's snobby, polite, expensive. And in comes this wee hard ticket covered in tattoos with piercings all over. And I'm thinking, are you sure this one's a Protestant? When the working day is over, both sides go back to their own separate communities. For most people in the city, the only time they meet across the divide is at work. They live separately, worship separately, drink separately. The schools are separate. As a child, you don't really know about this, but as you get older, you realize, well, there's a Protestant school and a Catholic school. There's a Protestant church and a Catholic church. There are Protestant shops. You know, there was two news agents in the town. There was the Protestant news agent and the Catholic news agent, you know, and uh, the Protestant supermarket and the Catholic supermarket and the Protestant uh, hardware shop and the Catholic hardware shop. So you became aware of that over time. And, you know, I suppose there would have been a tiny bit of prejudice, but not much. I mean, there was no real trouble in my town. There was a little bit of name calling. That was about it. You know, I think we called them proddy goats and they called us kitty cats. <laughs> this is Pintana, Pundi Tiroin, one of the six northeastern counties of Ireland which are held under British rule. Big families and little houses are normal in these back streets of Fintana. These two-room cottages in Brunswick Row have no running water and no sanitation. Against a background of such great need, how is it that council houses are built for people who either do not need new houses or can well afford to rent them in the ordinary way? The answer is a political one. 
Two-thirds of the people of this little town are nationalists. They are in favour of unity with the rest of Ireland and against being treated as part of Britain. One-third is unionist, which means favouring British rule and the partition of Ireland. But the town is controlled by that unionist minority and run solely in their interest. I was brought up believing that we were second-class citizens. The fact that we didn't own homes, because if we owned homes, then we would have a vote. It was a manipulated state. Housing was bad, the job situation was bad. Patrick Coyle has lived five years in a condemned house. We're living on there just like animals. Four children, three girls, one boy, away from myself, are in one room, a four by three room. We have no toilet, nor we have no uh, adequate uh, supply of water. My granny, my mother's mother, when she had her home, she had 14 children and they shared that house with another family. My daddy's family were nine children and they shared with another family and he remembers curtains partitioning. My daddy always relates to a story where a family eventually got a, a, one of the new houses in the Craigan estate. And about a month after they moved in, the council came along to see if everybody was fine. But the whole family were living in the kitchen. And the father of the family says, when is the next family moving in? Only to be told that this house was for them and they couldn't believe it because there was four bedrooms and there was another sitting room. So these are the stories that I grew up with. These people are gathering to protest. They're British, but with a difference. Over a quarter of them cannot vote in local elections. This is Londonderry. Protestant stronghold of the North, a city of religious rivalry, housing shortages, sweeping unemployment, and a mounting bitterness over civil rights. We shall Those who campaign for civil rights in Londonderry feel they share more than a song with civil rights movements elsewhere. They have even called themselves Britain's white Negroes. I think it was pretty clear that Catholics were discriminated against in Northern Ireland, particularly in terms of jobs. The jobs in the manufacturing industries seemed to be pretty sewn up for Protestant people. Uh, jobs in the civil service were scarce for Catholics. The police force was almost exclusively Protestant. In Northern Ireland, only one policeman in nine was Catholic. Unlike the police in the rest of the United Kingdom, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, was armed. If the Minister of Home Affairs thought that the situation demanded it, the police could be augmented by a voluntary part-time force, entirely Protestant, the B Specials. In October 1968, a civil rights march in Londonderry, which had been banned, met a police barricade of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. The behaviour of the police, and especially of their auxiliaries, the B-Specials, shocked the outside world. Clear evidence that something was alarmingly wrong with the state of Ulster. Here is the official North of Ireland view on partition. Forty years ago, 26 of the counties of Ireland broke away from Great Britain and formed an independent state. We in the north of Ireland, with a population of one and a half million people, decided by an overwhelming majority at a great national general election that we would remain within the United Kingdom. When the state was set up, you, you had, uh, I think, roughly 36% of the state w w would have been classed as nationalist. And that 36% did not support the formation of a government in Belfast. They wanted to be part of an all-Ireland government. And if you have a third of the people not supporting the government, then it was always going to be in problems and there was always going to be issues. And th those issues festered for years and years and years. In the early days of the new state, Protestant resolve was stiffened by the fact that the IRA made violent efforts to prevent the Northern Ireland government from functioning at all. The long and bitter struggle to secure its authority left an enduring mark on the character of the new regime. In the hundred years of the Northern Ireland existence, it has always been under attack from the IRA. There are always people getting killed. There's always threat of violence. There's always a threat of people uh, being shot. And that has not stopped since uh, the 1920s. The conflict rapidly worsened as the front line between Protestant and Catholic became a sectarian war zone. 
When the first British troops marched in, they were greeted by Catholics as saviors and army of liberation. I'm sorry for giving you this coffee. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Know. That's for after your lunch or after your dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. In the Catholic ghettos especially, appearance belied reality. Though the soldiers were still a novelty, the relationship had already become extremely fragile. In the absence of reform, the people would begin to turn on the troops, and the erstwhile liberators would soon be regarded as an army of occupation. The sort of training that we were doing was essentially sort of colonial stuff. Identified your target, you spotted the ringleader, uh, and if the crowd didn't disperse well, uh, and you had to open fire, he was the chap who shot first. I mean, this was the basic sort of teaching. Well, um, none of that applied. Michael was killed on Bloody Sunday, and that changed all of our lives. 13 men died on Bloody Sunday. It's impossible to exaggerate the way that this event burnt itself into the hearts and minds of the Catholic community. My father was a serving member of the RAF, but when Bloody Sunday happened, that was my mother's brother. So we came home. My daddy resigned from the RAF and we ended up living back in Derry, right back in the Bogside. The Bogside Londonderry, where it all began, where bigotry made fools of the world's church leaders who were trying to cool down religious differences, not heat them up. The Protestants foolishly marched. The Catholics foolishly threw stones. All hell broke loose. We were brought up through the troubles. So every day was stop and search, and every day was Brits and army on the streets. But as relatives of a Bloody Sunday victim, we were targeted very much, like all our neighbours and all our friends and extended family and stuff like that. So every day was stopping and searching, lots of raids. I remember my daddy getting arrested and taken out of the house one morning and another morning, a couple of raids after that, my mother was arrested and taken out of the house. And this was, this was normal. The police do not go into Catholic areas without the protection of the army. The searching of houses is a joint operation between the army and the police. Patrolling like this is relatively routine, but searching, which is probably the most contentious activity of the security forces, they don't allow to be filmed. I remember the soldiers coming into the house and taking apart me and my sister's doll's house, where you'd wake up and there'd be soldiers looking at you, armed soldiers, and... My mommy and daddy would be trying to bring us downstairs. The soldiers and the police would be on wrecking the house. The amount of funerals that I went to, of kids that were killed with plastic bullets, of hunger strikers, the two dairy hunger strikers, the amount of protests that I was on, the amount of bloody Sunday marches, and in the mean, in the middle of all that, I'm going to school and doing O levels and A levels and trying to be as normal as possible, have friends, follow the style, follow the music, um, be down at the riots. So when I was 18 years old, this fella that I knew asked me. Well, it seemed to me like he was asking me to help him join the ARA. And it turned out that he wasn't asking me to help him join. He was asking me to join up. And there was such a rush of adrenaline at that moment when I realised what he was saying, because I'd been to all the marches, been to all the demonstrations. And it seemed like he seen something more in me than marching and demonstrations. And it felt like, here's an opportunity to fight for my people, to fight for freedom. I had this idealistic, romantic dream of a free Ireland and and from what I had seen and experienced all over the years, the only answer to what was going on in our communities was to get the Brits out and take control for ourselves. 
So I became a member of the Harry. County Fermanagh is Northern Ireland's Lake District. In happier times, it could well be the holiday paradise the guidebooks all speak of. But the reality is that Fermanagh is the only county in Northern Ireland to be surrounded on three sides by a border with the Republic. Enclosed within it is about 25,000 Protestants. Many are farming along the border itself. The high ground you see away in the distance on the far side of the lake, that's the border that runs right along the, the back or across the, the far side of the mountain because the lake is all in the north. My family are from right on the border. My family are originally from Donegal and then we moved in um, before I was born in the late 50s um, to the northern side of the border. My father's theory was really to get a better farm, a better land and to a better education for the children. Um, and at that stage, I can recall, a, 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 as certainly as a child, that um, we mixed well with the Roman Catholic community within that area of Fermanagh. Unfortunately, that started to change. In 1969, 70, I already realised that it was these unionists along the border who were the bulwark for the British people along that border, um, that they would need to remove them, and that's what they consciously try to do is remove the border minority unions away. These are the gates into our old family farm. The border runs along the back of the farm, roughly half a mile away. And on the 30th of March, 84, that was the route they used. They parked on the other side of the river, uh, followed the hedgerows down to the farm and waited in the early hours until my brother went out to feed the cattle on the tractor and they shot him in the back on the tractor, shot him dead. My father, when my brother was murdered, was in his 70s, a place that he built up for years and they had to sell the farm very cheap. All the machinery was sold off cheap, the animals were sold cheap and my father, mother and young sister had to move into a rented house and still to this day rankles with me that Neighbours, people we had classed as friends, set my brother up and had him murdered. Not good. Now, I claimed he was on security forces. He wasn't. He had been on part-time UDR man for a short time and he left. He didn't like it and he'd been away from it seven years when they murdered him. I remember as a boy growing up in the unionist community, not the unionist community, look at those small farms as you can see around here, uh, and it's subsistence farming. And I know plenty of guys uh, joined either the police or the reserve police or the UDR or the British Army even, uh, to get a lot of extra pound to bring into the family, to put a bit of food on the table and have some quality of life. Most border farmers have always had at least one licensed shotgun close at hand, ostensibly for vermin. In the troubles of the 20s, their fathers patrolled with them at night. And those days are not forgotten even now. Many of these men served in the B-specials themselves and naturally enlisted into the ranks of the new UDR. Most Northern Protestants would have seen the border as almost like a defensive perimeter. You know, we, 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 we drew this line and we retreated behind it. And they could say, well, yes, it, it, it did stop Irish nationalism from taking over the entire Ireland. It did preserve our place within the United Kingdom. And that has to be acknowledged, you know, and, 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 and the reasons that they thought like that have to be acknowledged. When you see your neighbour getting out with uh, a gun on his shoulder or a gun on his hip, and you're on the road and you meet another neighbour, and that neighbour happens to be a nationalist neighbour, and they have a different, maybe, maybe they had a different attitude or a different upbringing, or they were, they were a different religion. And they take them out and they search them. And maybe they were searching in their house the night before. My God, to put two communities and, and divide them like that and put such animosity between them and enmity between them. In the last few weeks, this deceptive landscape has been the setting for a series of vicious sectarian murders and reprisals. And in an attempt to deter travelling gunmen, 
the army have started a limited campaign of blocking the border. Okay. Stand by. Blow now. Blowing up border crossings has long been an established army tactic. It's deeply resented by most local people, who in many cases have been quick to repair the damage. Uh, this road has never been blown before. It was uh, temporarily blocked at one stage with a Braithwaite tank. But uh, now it's been decided that, uh, to blow the bridge. What happened to the temporary blockage? The temporary blockage was uh, put in a long time ago, and it was uh, cut away. It was cut away by some of the local people by who Catalo wanted to, to reopen the road. To get their cattle over and go to the market <laughs> and come to church. And <laughs> all those good things, right? They haven't come to admire the view, but to dig up the road. And does this, this kind of thing affect your own personal attitude to the British and the Of course the it does. We resent this very much. And the very fact that they come in there and the fact that I have taken a shovel that they have left in the Republic means that they have been in the Republic violating our territorial boundary. You and they have absolutely no respect for us. I have confiscated the shovel and that is my evidence. And I'm prepared to give it to the guard that if they want. Otherwise, it'll be a souvenir. That's what you, that's what you got. Sir. Well, I took it. It wasn't given to me. That barricade there is absolutely useless to anyone except to deprive the people of this locality of their life. That's the only thing it's doing. It's a waste of time. In a couple of days, the people have opened the road again and taken out the obstacle with ease. The tightness and the nilness round that space. When the car stops in the road, the troops inspect its make and number. And as one bends his face towards your window, you catch sight of more on a hill beyond, eyeing with intent down cradled guns that hold you under cover. And everything is pure interrogation until a rifle motions and you move with guarded, unconcerned acceleration. A little emptier. A little spent, as always, by that quiver in the self. Subjugated, yes, and obedient. There was a lot of times when that part of crossing the border, your heart's in your throat, You're hoping to go that the bus doesn't get searched or whatever car you're in doesn't get searched. I was coming back on the bus and I had a, a handgun to bring back on the dairy. And I had the handgun down my trousers. Um, and I was on the back of the bus and there was this fella sitting beside me and there was a wee bit of flirty stuff going on and I remember thinking that if, if I didn't have this gun down my trousers that I probably would have went for it because he seemed all right. So here I am, the back of the bus on the way back today, and it was a long journey, and there's all this flirtation stuff going on. I go, ah, don't even go there. Oh. And when I got back to Derry, I actually had a massive bruise, the shape of a gun on my leg. My own view is that the British Army, that their position is a very, very um, dangerous one, because they now are like the, the bit of ham between two pieces of bread. And it may well happen that the British Army will take the blunt of the future struggle in Northern Ireland. Soldiers like these in the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers patrol this border for four months at a time. And they know, better than anyone else, that they're operating in bandit country. You're playing this very dangerous high-stakes game the entire time. Am I going to walk down that side or that side? I don't like the look of that car. I don't like the look of that lamppost. I'm not going where that bin is. Why are the windows open? What's that car doing down there with the engine on? Whenever we went near the border, the heckles went up and we were very, very wary of what could happen. And we'd been told about attacks coming over from the south into the north and how the provisional IRA would attack and then quickly go back over the border. So to us, the border was a very, very dangerous place. In my mind, I saw the border as being a threat because I saw, without even knowing anything of the politics, I'm not interested in the politics, I'm just a young infantry platoon commander holding a weapon who's thinking about the well-being of himself and his men. And for me, this represents a safe haven for my enemy. Because all I know is that they can just come from across the border or escape across the border almost with impunity, you know, and, 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 and launch attacks on us. 
The IRA were mounting illegal vehicle checkpoints along the border. Our company were tasked to put these observation positions along the border. And we were supposed to be waiting for the IRA to come across the border and mount these checkpoints. And we were going to stop them either by arresting them or other means. My group, comprising three men, another soldier, Lance Corporal Gavin Dean, who was in charge of us, and myself. And we went to this scrapyard, literally on the border. We found this old, derelict, rusty van that was quite close to the road. So if anything happened, we could get out of this van very quickly to do what we needed to do. Nothing happened the first night, everything was quiet. And then on the second day that we were there, as dusk was approaching, the, the sudden stillness and calm of the, the, the Ulster midsummer's evening was suddenly shattered by loud firing from across the border. I returned fire as best I could from where I thought they were. And as I did that, Lance Corporal Gavin Dean Dino was hit. I then ran out of ammunition and I picked up the rifle that, that, that Dino had had and then I was hit. I didn't know at the time, but I was hit in the spine just below my neck. The three soldiers were hiding here in the corner of the scrapyard when they came under fire. Exactly what they were doing here isn't clear but they may have been involved in some kind of SAS-type undercover operation. Dino was shaking next to me in some sort of violent spasm, trying to fight for his life, and his foot was kicking the side of my, side of my face. And it's something that... It's a sensation and feeling that I'll never forget. It's something that I'll probably take with me to my grave. After a short while, half the British Army sort of descended on this particular point on the border and put Dino on a stretcher, put me on a stretcher, and then they flew us to Belfast. And as we arrived there, that's when Dino actually died, just as we arrived. So he died just before midnight on the 16th of July, 1981. Later that day, uh, they decided to move me to a better neurological facility uh, over in uh, England. It must be very hard being as young as you are, and then suddenly something is hap like this happens. And... Um, yeah, well, I'm 20 years old now, and, and it happened when I was 19, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm quite young, but uh, there's people who are born with things like me from the start, so I'm not that bad off. How do you stay so cheerful? Oh, why not? I'm, I'm not in any pain, uh, so why not? The border is inside me all the time. Everything I do now is affected by that one moment in time. In an Irish tour, I always try and include Belfast and, and the north of Ireland. After all, I lived there for a while, and I learned a lot playing in the clubs there. So I have a certain home feeling for the place. Really, the only thing that kept the island together in those years was music. He was the ultimate hero up there, and he did cross that sectarian uh, divide that was such a phenomenon in Northern Ireland. And in the context of the most intense conflict, people from both sides of the divide came uh, to see Rory at those great gigs in, in the Ulster Halls. One sector of the economy that seemed to be immune from the violence and the mayhem was the entertainment industry. Hello, yes, uh, my name is Erdl and I know quite a lot. The stand-up comedian, I travel across the border regularly. You know, while a lot of comedians wouldn't go across the border, you know, you know during, during like intense you know, flashpoints in, in the history of the Troubles. You know, there were times, there were periods of months, maybe even years, where people just, you know, just didn't want to take the chance of going over. You know, I would relish the opportunity to go to the North. I remember just the reception I got when I stood on stage. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to do any jokes, really. Like, it was just the very fact that you came, that you were there. Thank you, thank you all very much, Mr. Thank you. 
Oh, that's just wonderful. That's just wonderful. I, I, I love it. Anyway, um, hello. So nothing would stop you crossing the border. In fact, if there was trouble, tension, it made you all the more determined to try and live as normal a life as possible. You know, people still wanted to go out and have a good time. So I suppose the biggest show in town in those days was the show bands. You know, these, uh, they were essentially cover bands and, you know, they travelled uh, over and back across the border at will. And the biggest band in the mid-70s was a band called the Miami Show Band. I didn't even know your name I didn't care cause I was setting I remember the Miami Show Band really vividly. They were, you know, from Dublin. But like all of those show bands, they, they played everywhere. I mean, they just treated the island as one place. I mean, there, there was no sense that, you know, you were you were a northern sh show band or a southern show band. They just played whatever dance halls were, 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 were available. They did a very charismatic lead singer called Fran O'Toole, who was writing his own songs, and he was a pin-up boy, like David Cassidy or something. You gotta smile a little more. They were travelling back from a gig, back to Dublin, and they were stopped at a checkpoint. It looked like an army checkpoint that they were stopped at. And they were told to get off the, the minibus. And they were lined up on the side of the road, and they were joking at first with the soldiers. But they realised something was slightly amiss. And what happened was people were planting a bomb on their minibus for reasons that are, are probably going to sound very arcane and almost too far-fetched for words. But the idea was that the UVF, for the Protestant paramilitary organisation, wanted to harden the border to stop terrorists coming across the border. And I think they were trying to illustrate the point by saying, look, Apparently, innocent people like the Miami Show Band are smuggling bombs across the border. So the idea was that the Miami Show Band would get back on their bus and that the bus would blow up at some point further down the road. And it would look like that they were smuggling bombs across the border. The bomb went off when they closed the, um, the back of the, of the personnel van and instantly killed the two guys that were standing at the van, that had, one of them had just pushed me. When it transpired that the objective was a complete and utter cock-up on their part, uh, they decided to assassinate the, the, the members of the band there and then on the side of the road. Fran was the good-looking lead singer, and they shot him 22 times in the face. They found the arm of one of the bombers was obviously blown up in the explosion and the arm had UVF tattoos. So that's pretty clear cut that the person who was planting the bomb was a self-styled member of a Protestant paramilitary organization. The murders of the Miami show band seemed at the time like a kind of deliberate attack on that fragile but beautiful texture of everyday life. You know, where people just gone on with living together in the same place and having the same kind of enjoyment, listening to the same kind of music, flirting with members of the opposite sex from whatever denomination they were. That those murders really just seemed like a particularly brutal assault on the pleasures of daily life that had kept some sense of unity together for people. Colonel Prosser inspects the walls of Derry. It's only the army who go on the walls now. Before 1968, it was a regular walking place for the people. How's the bug side this morning? The walls were closed because they were designed only too well. They overlook so much of the surrounding city that they're ideal either for sniping or observing. This mural down here. It depicts the innocents, the innocent lives lost in this war and in all wars. But the, the image is of a young woman called Annette McGavigan who lived up in this area. And when she was coming home from school, she was shot by a British soldier and killed in the Troubles. There was a lot of innocent people, children, that got caught up in the Troubles. Guns came to take away our sons. 
This is the regular Saturday afternoon shooting incident in Struban. A bomb exploded near the war memorial in Inniskillen, County Fermanagh. The crowd which had gathered there was given no warning. They were civilians, Catholic and Protestant, young and old, there with their wreaths to remember. There were a number of staging posts in atrocity. Actually on the border. Where the legitimacy of the IRA's campaign was being fundamentally questioned by the very community on whose behalf it was supposed to be waged, which were, you know, Northern Catholics. Patsy had his own business when we were married. He had a mobile fruit and vegetable van, and he went bankrupt in this business. So he took the job with the army because it was the only thing available here in Derry at the time. The IRA let themselves into the house. Somebody ran up and stuck something in my neck. I was told, if you do what you're told, nobody will get hurt. And Patsy put his arms around me and he says, everything will be okay, girl. I'll be back soon. Even if someone was a Catholic, it didn't make any difference. They were still considered as a legitimate target by the IRA. They took him across the border to where they had the safe house and where the van was. They chained Patsy to the controls of the van. I will surmise that he knew by this time he was going to die. Because as they went across the border, they couldn't stay in the car with their masks on. So it's quite possible that Patsy recognized them or would have recognized them at a future time. So he knew from midnight on until the explosion at 4 a.m. for four hours that he was going to die. The Koshquin checkpoint outside London, Derry, was a heavily fortified army position guarding one of the main crossing points on the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. Afterwards, all that was left was a pile of rubble. I've had evidence from surviving soldiers that Patsy saved lives that night, which is something that I'm very proud of because uh, with him being chained into the van, he obviously knew he wasn't getting out. He wasn't going to get out live, but he shouted as soon as he stopped the van, he shouted, run lads, I'm loaded. The murder of Patsy Gillespie was a, was a, just a particularly grotesque moment. I mean, even, you know, we, we got used to atrocity, but this moment seems like one that there was just a darkness to it. And you, and you thought, it's almost like this darkness is emanating out of something beyond the immediate, you know, that it's, it's as if all of this toxicity which has been built up in this landscape for so long is expressing itself in something as horrible as this. Right, do you know what? It has to be somewhere along this part of the road because this is the Kosh Kwan Road. So it's somewhere on that stretch. By the powers of deduction, I've never had to really think about it before. We reckon that this is the point where the north meets the south. When the word came through that Patsy Gillespie and those five soldiers down at Kosh Kwan had been, had been killed in the bomb, you have to you think about it. Bombs weren't unusual, horrific deaths weren't unusual. Um, that was the norm for us here, but there was something about the fact that my organisation had taken this man from his home, held his family hostage, but chained him in the van where he had no escape, then remote control, the explosion and I was a member of the organization at that time but when the news came through my stomach hit the floor my heart was ready to burst and I cried and I thought what the hell have we become oh there has to be a better way than this 
I remember being in the kitchen and my parents, nobody knew, none of my family knew that I was in the ARA. They was leading this massive secret double life. Um, and my daddy had his hands on the counter in the kitchen and the news had, was on the radio, it was on the TV. And I remember saying to my daddy, Daddy, that's not what we're about, is it? And he says, no, and that's not what we're about. It was after Patsy's death, more than anything, that my involvement with the IRA and just dissipated. And eventually I would leave Derry and move to Limerick. The horror at, at the murder of Patsy Gillespie definitely did create a revulsion that in the long term, the IRA and Sinn Féin had to respond to. Sinn Féin leaders will meet the Irish Prime Minister Bertie Ahern tomorrow to discuss the state of the peace process. There's been reports of divisions within the IRA over how best to proceed. When the Labour Party get in, one thing that they had was a huge majority. And history had taught us, not just in Ireland but elsewhere, that it didn't depend on what their politics was, but that they had the strength behind them to, to, to make big steps. An historic agreement for peace in Northern Ireland has been reached within the past few minutes. We can see pictures now from Stormont, where the leaders of the eight parties which have been involved in the talks, together with the Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, are announcing details of an agreement which is intended to end nearly 30 years of conflict and which have cost more than 3,000 lives. I never thought in my lifetime I would see it. But what we're talking about here is something as mammoth as the collapse of the Berlin Wall. I just remember celebrating wildly when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. I mean, it was right up there as one of the great occasions in recent Irish history. I mean, it was like, it was like the birth of a child or something, or it was like, you know, Ireland winning the World Cup. It was like, a, a, it, was, it was an extraordinary occasion. Every household in Northern Ireland, including mine, was sent a copy of the Good Friday Agreement. It set out a plan to disarm the men of violence, release paramilitary prisoners, and for both sides to share power in government. And then we voted on it. And the people of Northern Ireland had until half an hour ago to decide whether they're prepared to do what everyone, from the President of the United States through Prime Ministers in London and Dublin and most political leaders here, want them to do and endorse the Good Friday Peace Agreement. The Northern Ireland referendum, the 22nd of May, 1998. I hereby, give, I hereby give notice that the percentage votes given at the referendum was as follows. Yes, 71.12%. The other brilliant thing about the Good Friday Agreement was you were allowed to choose whatever nationality you wanted to be. You could choose to be Irish in Northern Ireland, or you could choose to be British in Northern Ireland, or, like me, you could choose to be both. When you see the prisoners and you know that some of the things that they've done coming out of prison, uh, big smiles and handshakes, you sort of think, you know, this, this isn't right. But the more, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, this is right. This is the way to go forward. when the army is off the border, when the watchtowers are taken down. A miracle happens. The border doesn't disappear, but it just becomes irrelevant. And it really meant that vast numbers of people on the island could just get about the business of living. When I came back to Settland area in 2001, I didn't realise that I had a lot of stuff inside, a lot of stuff that I hadn't dealt with. So I went down the road of peace and reconciliation and would come to dialogue with Patsy Gillespie's wife. I knew when the group met up that one of them was an ex-IRA woman. And I was curious to meet her. That first meeting of all of us women together was unbelievably nerve-wracking. I was nearly sick. Because now, for the first time, I would be telling who I was. I was 13 when the hunger strikes began, and that was all anyone talked about. I could have told you the names and times of death of each of the hunger strikers. They are our saviours, our heroes, our protectors. In my eyes, they could do no wrong. Before I turned to Kathleen, I thought, whatever this woman has to say to me, whatever this woman has to do, I'm just going to take it. And I was prepared for grief, because I had heard that Kathleen was a tough cookie. And when I turned around, she threw her arms around me and she gave me a big, massive hug. And sometimes I get emotional when I tell this part of the story. And she says, we're going to be OK. 
Thank you, sir. If you look at the two extremes of myself, whose husband was murdered so wickedly by the IRA, just so brutally, and I'm best friends with an ex-IRA woman. We are the embodiment of what can be. But I will never, ever forgive the IRA because they just tore my life and my families apart. I mean, Patsy wasn't there for his daughter's wedding. Patsy should have been there for that. People on the outside, they thought, oh, they have a ceasefire and they have a peace process. And so that's all that sorted. Now we don't have to worry about Northern Ireland anymore, but it's not sorted. It's not by a long way sorted. This attack has been linked to the dissident Republican group known as the new IRA, a prescribed organization which aims to bring about a united Ireland. Northern Ireland has a long way to go yet. People go to their own churches, their own schools, their own community centers, their own pubs, they live in their own areas, and it may as well be down a racial line. The one thing we absolutely definitely know as a matter of fact about the Irish border is it is unpoliceable. Nobody has ever been able to control it and nobody ever will be able to control it. We simply know that if you put up any physical infrastructure, it will become a magnet for attack. Don't put everyone through all this again, you know, what happened all those years ago, you know, with the, with the border posts and, and all the checks and everything on the border. Don't put us through that again, because too many lives were lost, too many people were, were broken. Are we all fine? Are we, are we all over it? Is it all out of our systems? I mean, there is a theory that the entire country of Northern Ireland suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that true? I don't know. There's some talk yet now, if the border comes back, that there, that's a possibility that they could be smuggling again. But I'll tell you one thing, I'll not be involved in anything like that again. Not for a minute. You could have been shot. You could have been shot. But I survived, or I wouldn't be talking to you.